Good evening and welcome to the Laughing Monkey Music Show. Today we're on Dave Fortman. How are you? Good. Well, this was easy. Guess, guess we're finally getting together. It was like <laughs> easy breezy. Yeah, Dave, if we don't know. It was sort of oh, easy, man. It was easy. Thank you for, for tech supporting <laughs> me to get on to, to Zoom. It was, a, it was a small bump in the road. It was all good. Um, so if you don't know Dave, Dave is, does a lot of production work with um, Godsmack, um, Evanescence, but you're also a guitar player, and one of my favorite bands is um, yes. Uncle Joe. So oh, how are yeah. you doing? I'm doing good, man. Uh, yeah. Basic afternoon, got some groceries. Tried to get out, ran a little bit. And by a little, I mean a, a little. Like, not much running, but I, at least I moved around. <laughs> but, uh, but then I got a mix later. So same old thing, just sitting here in my little studio in the sky. So how does that how does that work for you as a producer like right now before we go into the the other kid Joe stuff, like for projects and stuff? Are you just out there working and do you have a lot of stuff sent to you? Or are you working through a team or you know what I'm saying? Now, yeah, people uh, send me stuff. You know, right now it's uh, some friends of mine that have had a, a large accomplishment. You know, they're called the Chiwis. It's a cover band. I've known them for ever. I've known the drummer for a, for a long time. Uh, produced one of his bands, Tom's House, and back in the early 2000s uh, and they'd got inducted to the Louisiana Hall of Fame. They're so good. They're so popular as a, a cover band, you know, they're, they're oh, wow. amazing musicians. So they want to have an EPK. I think that's what they're doing. I didn't get the whole story. Uh, so I'm trying to mix eight songs, that, which is difficult because it's all tied together as a live show. And so okay. I figured last night that the best way to approach it is like, go, so I don't get too bogged down it because it's, it's. I think that they have to have it tied together because it, it seems to me that the, the, the transitions are all they're like a necessary. collage type of thing, like a big melt melody. I I guess so because it's like if you try to fade the first song, well then he's in the, he's in there saying, "Wait, well, hey, what's going on, everybody?" Oh. You know, like, and then the next one's the same way, or there's some kind of transition. So I figured I need to look at it in blocks, you know, get the first one and just go in and start doing volume automations on the things that change or any kind of settings just have to be song to song. Cause I keep listening past that, you know, and it's like, I'll never get done if I keep listening to it as a giant, you know, whatever hour and a half song, you know, I'm driving myself crazy, but yeah, I have a, a better grip on it. So this well, evening, that, 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 that's really long for a press kit too. It's a lot of songs. Yeah, I, you know, I don't know if, what they're doing with it, but it's for something. And I've just forgot what he told me. So I don't know. <laughs> okay. We'll, we'll, We'll if you say you're also working, working, um, do some Godsmack too. You're working on that right now. Yeah, we just finished. Uh, I just mixed the new Godsmack, and man, what a oh, that record is insane, man. So good. I think that uh, by a mile, I think Sully has outwritten himself with just uh, you know, there's introspective looks in his own life, and I hope you know I'm not good with English, so I hope that's the right word, introspective. <laughs> but it's <laughs> I'll put, up close, I'll put up captions. I'll, I'll put captions in there for you. <laughs> Give me the right word below the one where we'll, I Yeah, we'll up. do that. We'll do that. But yeah, the songs are fantastic. And the, the lyrical content, you know, on top of the chord progressions and, and wow, what a record, you know. Yeah. And we, we busted our ass on it. And finally, just finished the mix, just got it back from Ted Jensen um, for about the last week or whatever. And so we're really stoked on it, you know. That's good to hear because I know for a while he was on the fence about the band being back together or going together. It's been a weird couple of yeah. years. I know he did some solo, so it's good to hear that he's, you know, even if he spaces them out, you know, and takes yeah, a break. He's a, he's a solid human, you know. He he's right. he's got. I mean, I, I think out of any artist I've ever known, <clears throat> Sully is the most dedicated to his own people and his own family, you know, and. Uh, I mean, geez, he keeps he keeps in touch with everybody. You know, he's just a I think a great guy. I fucking love him to death, and I think he's you know such an instrumental uh, player in his in his own creations. You know, and I mean, I love being around those types of artists. You know, especially yeah. Yeah. you know you know when a dude like that, like he, Joey Jordanson was like that. You know, Corey Taylor. You get in a room with these guys, and you know that there's there's, there's at least in my mind, you know, if I'm going to look at it as this musicality thing, you know, and spiritual 
Like, how do these people exist, man? They change the world. I mean, this fuck guy's been doing it 27 years. Yeah. Having number one hits off his albums for that fucking long, you know. And it, you get in a room with these people, and there things change, man. And the way he feels and, and can, you know, dictate even mix changes in the, his his he's a great producer as well i mean this guy's a surprise me i mean he's a drummer this, a guitar player guys, yeah well, he's a, just all around great musician uh and me you know and me and him are great friends on the on the other side of life just being dudes we're very compatible people but we also work great together and uh i certainly think he's one of those guys man you know every time i've been in the room with people like that man i mean you, you could just feel that they we're just somehow born to do this and it's it's incredible to be around him and the, and the way things change when he's involved i think it's really special yeah he's one of the people i've yet to speak to in my like my life but he's on my list my, my show yeah, he's, he's an amazing character man i love he's, him he's great really good friend of mine <clears throat> so you actually mentioned um yeah slipknot you've actually did some work with slipknot too another I, yeah i'm pretty sure all of us gone uh in in 2008 which was a massive accomplishment, you know, for everybody. You know, at the time they were literally on like just different islands, you know, and they were not really speaking to each other. A lot of a lot of internal things happening. Yeah. Um, and I want to get into out there. And things, you know, but, but you know, and Joey, everybody's in yeah. these. And so, you know. I went ahead and made the album without bringing them all together, you know, and, 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 you know, they had split into two camps. So it made it really difficult for me. Um, certainly I, I got along with all of them, but the fact is when the camp split, I had to choose a side really it just to get done with the record in time. So, Oh, really? Um, yeah. And it, you know, and in the end, I mean, you know, it, it, really what happened was that, the main songwriter crew, which is only three guys that that literally have written the history of Slipknot, it was just Corey, Paul, and Joey. You know, right? Uh, Joey had all the demos, and so every you know when when they, I think at that level of fame and money that that you know when you get the itch to want to write too, like everybody mm -hmm. wants to write. So you know, Jim and Sean had all these songs which I loved. I thought they were, it was great material, but it's like, how do I make all this into one thing? You know, it's going to end up on the same record when we all have, we have a certain amount of time and they're not right. really communicating, you know, and there's just all these things happening. So I had to kind of buckle down and just go with the main crew with songwriters, you know, and I got along famously with those three and a couple other dudes. But the, I knew I could hear that it was it was in the music already. We already had it. The album it didn't need to have rewrites, you know. And a lot of the yeah. guys were like, "Oh, but it needs to be more songs and rewrite and stuff," because they wanted to obviously have music on the album. So they went and made another studio, man, next door. Like we're out in the cornfields at this place in Jamaica, Iowa, and we're in the main studio. So those guys go rent a bunch of equipment, you know, and they're making like a look, which was a cool record, but. It, I didn't have time to put all that into like the Slipknot record while me and Joey are focusing on what would essentially become a, a very important record for those guys, man. Yeah, it is. One, I mean, this platform, I mean, psycho, you know, psychosocial snuff was on there, which I had to fight to get that thing into, into shape. I mean, it was an incredible journey, but point being, being in a room, I mean, it, you know, it's the only time in, in my career, and maybe once or twice with Sully, where you want to be a producer and you and you want to you know you want to make them think oh he did a lot to the record because he made all these changes but when as a producer I could hear that it didn't need to be changed man right. you know it was spot on I mean like Corey would do three takes of a song Snuff is nothing more actually Snuff is a one take song man he sang the whole fucking thing through. And loved really? it. And me too. I loved it too. Snuff is not, it's not produced in any way vocally. You know, that thing's, that's just a one take all the way through. And most of the songs are either just an entire verse picked out and then he listened and make me take another verse. But it was a situation where you feel like they're going to think you did nothing. But the fact is, you did a lot by not changing it. And that's, you know, I could have gone in and said, oh, well, it could have been, you know, let's do this again. Keep, give me more, give me more, give me more, just to have, like, takes. 
which wouldn't have made any fucking difference because I would hear it and go, though I told Corey any of those three takes that we did on all any of the heavy stuff too. You know, there's obviously there's some stuff we punch for sections, but but dude, part of your job as a producer is to recognize when greatness just happened. Right. You want to cultivate. You, sometimes it. you gotta sacrifice them thinking, you know, the artist thinking that you're not producing them. But you have, I, you know, I stood strong and just like, you know, it, and of course, it, you know, it bites you on the ass a little bit. You know, I think it was, uh, they were on like VH1 or something, or some interview and the chick's all, you know, so how was, what, you know, what was it like working with Dave Foreman? He really, really didn't know what to say. You know? <laughs> he's like, well, he taught me to, you know, because I didn't teach him shit. He doesn't need to be taught anything. This dude just needs to sing. And it's, it's stunning to hear this guy on a microphone, man. And his throat gets all big. He's just all, uh, and his lyrics are fantastic. It, it, yeah, you know you have to realize sometimes that you, you know, your input might not be fucking needed. Now, whereas other artists, you know, like people might listen to Amy Lee and think that oh, she's so rad that she just sang it through, you know. But that's not the case at all. You know, like there's many things that we would go over. You know, my immortal. My Immortal became a, a giant smash hit, right? And that fucking outro piece in the band version that came out and was on YouTube and did all the bullshit, uh, you know, the outro, I've been alone all these years, of the bridge was what just wouldn't fit. I mean, we we took a, it, it, I would have her just come back to stuff, you know, when she starts sounding great, she'll come back yeah. and we'll try to redo parts as she's sounding really great. But all those things, yeah, those are comped. Like we, you know, those things are have been heavily picked through uh, to come up with what vocal you hear on the. And album. that was uh, was it was it Ben? Was it Ben Ben Moody? Ben he Moody. was in the band at the time. He was there in the band too. Yeah, which he was a huge part of the sound. I think gigantic. He's, well, he's a songwriter, man. I know that. But I'm saying, like now, I don't even I haven't heard anything by them. I did. Now, yeah, well, yeah, those days are were right. set and gone, man. I mean, we got you know at least you know we had the open door. Um, and I would say the writing, the whole deal, you know, which still evanescence, but you're not ever going to get the fallen sound back because it's impossible to the elements that were in that band, Dave Hodges included, uh, don't exist, you know. So I still love what they do. I mean, no, it's not, it's not a dig, it is a certain rap. sound. It was just like you get the sound, the song, oh, yeah. the team, and more... the timing, and the timing in, in, in the industry because it's luck, no doubt. And you know, the difference, the real difference is if you look at it from a songwriting standpoint is that Ben had a more simplistic view of going from, let's just use like Nashville counting system, uh, the Nashville ca ca uh, county system. You know, he was more of the minor one to the six mm -hmm. guy, you know, in, you know, many of those songs are written like that, you know, bring me to life is, you know, what minor one to G and then to D and then to back to minor one E, which, it's very simple, you know, and then God bless Amy for writing the lyrics on top of that. But in my immortal, I mean, that was written, Ben wrote the lyrics to that when he was like a teenager or something. So that combination between the three of them uh, and Hodges more, I don't think how many, I'm not sure. He wrote like the bridge to my immortal, but, mm -hmm. but, you know, obviously the chemistry, he, he's one of the biggest heroes of all time. My God, to get kicked out of the band. And then I did a record with him, and not, not to change subjects, but I'll, this is a pretty important thing. This guy, <coughs> he makes this beautiful record, Trading Yesterday, with me, and it's just gorgeous. I mean, what an album. Uh, and then all of a sudden, they get dropped because they want the, the a company signs the fray. And here he comes, man. Him and Ben were doing some co-writing. But then Dave went on his own to become a massive songwriter, you know. And there was a night where I'm sitting in Montreal, visiting my kid and i was i just said well i want to you know look up what hodges is doing and i realized that he had done a thousand years with christina perry and that song i mean i was crying my face off i'm like it, that song wrapped up like his whole trading yesterday record like all slammed into one beautiful amazing track man it, it blew me away man I, I had a seriously religious experience listening to that track man it blew it blew my mind but Though he's, but you know, but but the three of them, they're only three dude, they're only three kids. When I when when I got paired with Evanescence by Wind Up Records, 
you know, it was three kids and me. We're all Southern Baptist. I'm, I'm Louisiana. They're Arkansas. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was a great match for us to get together. And none of us thought that it would go that big. It just wasn't in the cards, you know. Amy would joke and say, oh, we're going to go gold, you know, like, <laughs> which was hilarious until the world got a hold of it. And it turned out to be well, far from actually what happened. And it went, you know, 17 million world long. Yeah, I was going to say, it's quite a platinum over a few times over. Huge. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, the, the songwriting of it, though, you know, if you go from fall, like just take Fallen, which is the biggest record, obviously, and just go front to back, they're they're generally all written. I mean, by and large, written a lot. It's all, you know, for for basic people listening or whatever. It would just be like if you're playing an E minor, you know, or like this, you know. If you're, here, I'll play the guitar for you. Like it's like if it's all. I'll tune regular. That's a minor one down to six. Mm -hmm. You can move around. It's been in very pop sort of or dark, like almost like movie themes, you know. Right. Very emotive. Wake me up inside. Wake me up inside. Call my name. You know what I'm saying? That's all bring me to life, really. Is. And it, but it doesn't sound like that because we got Dave Campbell on the strings just going nuts. You know, and, and the verse is all. Well, most songs are, the more basic they are, the bigger the songs, you know what I mean? People don't realize how simple that is. I'm playing funk. I'm doing it in Southern funk. <laughs> yeah. A little more groove to it. But that's all the fucking thing. <coughs> I think it's a bridge. I mean, it's, it's, that's the beauty of, in the tragedy, all in the same time, is when, when you lose Ben Moody and you lose all that simplicity, you know, imaginary and all these things, that the, the chord progressions and his ability to make this simplistic huge thing that the world loved you know only man if they could have put put aside their differences and just made one more man it, I, I always wondered what that would have been like you know because then we moved into the biggest song of the next record being call me you're sober totally different vibe right still was successful sold a couple of million albums Which but nowhere suck. but it's not anywhere by any means anywhere near what what the stuff like the the rhythm progressions which matters a lot you know to build a song on top of nothing like what ben was doing and uh, and they've never been to that zone you know well that's the thing a band like evidence is not a band i would normally listen to but that yeah. album because i'm also Ball. a fan of yeah. i'm also a fan of music and of songwriting yeah there's no way around and playing it, it's a good album as it, far it as really songwriting is. goes and it's not yeah, about it's... anything else to me yeah because yeah sometimes like stylistically some people may not like it but from a, like, if you're, you're a songwriter or you're into music or, or you're a professional that knows progressions, then you can't really deny Fallen, man, you know, because the two of them, as a songwriter team, Amy and Ben at that time, uh, were some of the best on the planet, man. And they proved it, you know, with, with how many people. And, and I think the production, you did a good job in the production. I went to college yeah, well, for, for production. Yeah. So I have a, a little extra. Yeah, now uh, invested yeah. when I when I when I want to um I listen to stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah. A little more critical. <laughs> if I'm really yeah, I did. Back. You know, I busted ass on that thing, man. I remember Alan Meltzer, rest his soul, uh, when we had turned in "Bring Me to Life" because it was going to go out earlier because it was going to be on Daredevil the soundtrack, and you know we were all just like, "Wow, man, we we're in a movie! Holy shit, this is the best!" And so he would tell he say called me says Fortman sounds like you worked on every bar of that song you know the New York accent and I said well fuck I did you know <laughs> and I mean just to give you the actual science of of what I did to like bring me to life yeah. you know biggest song of my career well at the end of each course it used to go to what is now bridge a 
Bring me to life. And I told him, it sounds like we're going to the bridge every time we get finished with the chorus. So I got all, I took all the, I took the first one that did that. And we just made two of them at the bridge. And then we went into the, to the regular bridge. So it's bridge A, bridge B now. Choruses go right back to like those things that go. Wake me up inside. Well, that didn't exist. And then we got the outro. So then we brought the outro up bigger. Um, with Josh Freeze going nuts on the drums and all that. Uh, and the Maniac. And Good that drum sound, too. Yeah, he, yeah, very easy with that guy. But the, but those, you know, the way that feels is a lot more concise feeling than rather than having each of those choruses have this outro piece, you know. It's like a mm -hmm. chorus B every time, which was, I thought, not necessary. And so everyone else agreed. The band loved it. Uh, and certainly the A&R. Uh, Victor Mur Murgatroyd and, and Alan Meltzer, Diana, and all those guys ended up really loving the production on it. So I did the right thing. You know, I got that gig. I ended up get, I got that gig because I produced this band, Voice It's Fire, before Evanescence with the uh, Wind Up Records. And thanks to Jay Baumgartner, who gave me a fucking career. You know, he let me co-produce with 12 Stones. And then he gave me, they asked him to do Voice It's Fire. He was busy, I think, with Seether. So they let me do Boys It's Fire and under Jay's executive production. So I had a chance to really just go in and start making notes. And this is a punk rock band, kind of punk emo at the time, mm -hmm. uh, that had really, I mean, when I, I mean, what, I mean, long arrangements, man. Like longer than this is like, it's like three bridges in this fucking monster of the song. And I'm just like, you know, back then, you know, I was up and gum and starving. I was like, fuck it. You know, I have a picture of my son when he was like two and a half or three. And butt naked to kind of walk around the house. And I'm sitting there making the notes that would change my life on Boy Sits Fire. So they ended up nicknaming, nicknaming me the Butcher because of the arrangements I did on that shit. And they had tried other people to do the arrangements. So Alan Meltzer had fallen in love with the fact that I could do that to songs. And so... Pop them up and kind of put it back know, with it. And Evanescence but... wasn't... Evanescence wasn't just something that got handed to, in, to me in my lap out of nowhere. They had been developing in Los Angeles, man, for a year. They wanted to have the band develop, and, and I think they even made Amy go to like Im, like improv classes or some shit like that, acting classes. But those guys, Evanescence, uh, they were waiting on Don Gilmore, the guy that did Linkin Park, mm -hmm. the, you know, albums or whatever in. Uh, so that came, you know, Alan Meltzer made the cold call after Boy Sets Fire and inviting me to New York and offered me an A&R job or vice president A&R, uh, which I didn't take because it would be exclusive to that company. But in, in the same meeting, he offered me Evanescence. And so he called Amy and Amy freaked out, was yelling at him and shit like, well, you're going to throw us to the wolves, this guy from my Linky Joe. And so he also told him, well, they, we're going to fly you and Ben down to New Orleans to meet with this guy, you know. And so took one dinner, man. We were off to the races. Very I said, cool. "Look, I got the keys. I got. I have the keys to the record company's heart right now, man. You know, and you usually have to wait this long to to get Don Gilmore. And Alan loves me. Let's go do this shit. And so it all worked out, man. We're stoked. Still stoked. One of the things yeah. to me, and I, well, I don't want to say that. I know that, that album is is it's the type of music is it's a very epic music. And the problem is, I think a lot of bands to try to copy it almost sound too big, like the notes are escaping." I think you found a point where it was epic and large, but punchy, where it yeah. didn't, where it felt like it still had a, a home. The song felt like it still had a structure. Where sometimes it feels like you're up on a mountain on some of these type of um, emo epic -y bands in that oh, genre, yeah. where it just feels like it just goes, and you're like you're waiting for it to come back to you. Whereas that album in particular has a punch, and you know where you're at. You know, no doubt. Yeah, I so said a lot of aspects. Uh... That are critical. Uh, if, if you get a chance, go listen to Imaginary, uh, which is, I think, one of the reasons, you know, these kind of epic moments. The intro that Dave Campbell and Dave Hodges came up with to that is absolutely stunning. Right. Also, there at the point of the bridge, and I went back like a nerd and counted how many individual people were actually playing between a choir that we doubled dave campbell's orchestra that we doubled there's something like 76 individual people playing at the same time in the bridge at the end of the solo <coughs> when it goes to solo it, and so it 
it's massive, you know, and I, th and a lot of the organic nature of that record is that it's not like modern day stuff that sounds like Evanescence. It's all like clicky drum samples, you know, that's actually a real drum set, man. There's no, there's no samples in there. I'm so critical of drums. That's what I'm saying. I like that album. Yeah. It's a hundred percent natural. So I think Josh Free's playing. So it's really, oh, he's, he's a monster to mix, but you can hear it where, Things aren't always perfect, and they, you know I love it when the kick and the snare—they're not always defined. And, and it's something like, and the guitars are large and warm. You know, it's kind of Godsmack's kind of the new Godsmack's kind of like that. I mean, I try to get a little bit out in every album to where it's not like exactly because when everything sounds like it's going to be every when everything sounds like it's the same volume, it, yeah, you can hear everything, and then it sounds like it's going to blow up. To me, that's the kind of records I, I really love. And so El Evanescence, believe it or not, as goth as it is, has a lot of rock, like basic rock tonality that well, I gave. Well, Josh's it. drumming makes a difference because he, he plays on so many different artists. I've talked to him in other yeah. shows. So he doesn't have a certain, he's not a metal drummer. He's not, he has a bit he's of a not, swing. Yeah. Almost like you say, like, Bill Ward was not a metal drummer in, in Sabbath, but he had, yeah. he's like a jazz drummer. No doubt, it's huge. So, so, so to me, I'm saying it's a, it's a it's that little bit of a turn that Josh yeah. can do on so many different types of music that makes the band can sound so so different. And you're like, what is that sound? Like, why does it sound different? Just because of his drumming, his That's swing. Exactly. It. And yeah. initially, you know, initially the band, the, their vision of it from the demos was way more metal. You know, I think there was even a time when I'd done a rough. I was trying to mix Bring Me Life, but, you know, we ended up going with Jay mixing it. It was my first attempt, you know, and I remember Amy being in the car and she, and we gave her the CD and so she's jamming on She's like, wait, that doesn't sound right. You know, it's like, it's, the guitars are all wrong. And she put the demo on, it was like, the, you know, it was a Metallica kind of thing. But Ben, I mean, Ben had already switched over to, to realize that we're going for a different yeah. kind of mixture of rock and metal and not just trying to be like, you know, with the, clicky super clicky drums but that's how that all i mean it's it's mostly just a luck shot it's not like i fucking you know planned to make out you know i didn't have a vision of how it would fucking turn out man it just sort of landed in my lap that way i just went after it you know and just whatever felt great to me at the time and i got josh in there <coughs> and uh with no use of samples and it just sounds rad you know and well, if I, he, I mean, I don't, I don't remember any samples at all, because uh, I have the files. I don't know if they're from the mix session, but I don't see any samples on them. I know that Jay used just a pinch of snare. And if I did, it might have been a little snare backing. But when I listen to it now, I don't hear any. I can tell when there's a sample in there, you know. But this is, I mean, you can hear Josh's ghost notes. You can hear him roll out of things without even a glitch. So that means that that big old Tama Bell brass is still sitting in there naturally, you know. What a drummer. It's really good. I think and the other thing I'd say is yep. I think um Sully being a guitarist and a drummer is kind of a kind of in that a lot of the, actually a lot of people like this. Yet uh Charlie Burnett from uh, Anthrax and then Dave Grohl. Yeah. The, the 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 um the drummers that play guitars that are songwriters. Yeah. And, and the way it affects the songwriting, you know. Oh, big time! Not, yeah. Even if Shannon's an, Shannon's an awesome drummer, but then you got oh, so, but, so, so, and, but I'm saying but so is solo. Like, so I mean, you, once again, you have two great drummers. Yeah, I know. Oh, you know, band together. Yeah, right. So I that, mean, that yeah, that solo thing they do live is it still kills me, man. When I, I'm like, wow, when the two of them get together, I yeah. enjoyed you know whatever. I think it was like two years. I think I I forget. Wait, I mean Shannon. No, it was more than that. No, of course we were in the band till the band broke up. So. I had like three, four years, I think, of, of jamming out with Chan Dog, Chan Larkin. And, and dude, my God, I mean, dude, there would be nights in clubs, man, where <laughs> I shit you not. I would look at the audience and they're fucking looking at Chan. They're like looking at Whip. He's looking at Chan. He's all like, a... and he's killing it. You know? And yeah, I've seen him, I've seen him play with Gunsmack. It's a pleasure to play all those and years and play with him. I think I've, I've seen him play with both bands, actually. I'm getting so old now. The mouth of, oh, did you see Ugly Kid with Shannon? I think I did, yeah. I've seen Ugly Kid a few times. I remember the first time oh, I saw Ugly Kid. Yeah. And it was um, right after the EP came out. I, th I don't even remember if you were. I think you may be part of the band. I'm up in New England. And I think that uh, you guys are opening for somebody. And they're like, who's this band? And it, the single had just come out. 
or had been out. But then they go, what is the song we're going to do? And you guys announced I'm um, doing um, Cradle, you know. And, and, oh, and, yeah. and, and like, it hadn't been out yet. And then I'm like, we just moshed to it. I'm like, this is the best thing ever. This is the best thing ever. We just moshed it. <laughs> you know, Sweet. the Harry Chaffin. I was like, this is the best thing ever. I, I totally remember the night. You know, like it was yesterday. Because it was in a club. Like you opened, and it was catching the cradle, dude. Never I'm like, this is the best thing ever. <laughs> yeah. And it wasn't out yet either. At the time, I'm like, and then when it came out in the album, I was like, oh, yes. That was the oh, first time I think. Yeah. You know. <laughs> Somewhere up in Connecticut. I live up in New England, so I was up there. Um, I, don't remember, I don't even remember what club it was now. It's been so long. But it was a good time uh, period. Yeah, it, it was really good. <clears throat> and that's the thing actually we talked about, uh, Ugly Kid Joe. The sound is a weird time for everybody because I, I don't even know what you guys would consider yourself. I hate labeling bands anyhow. I know I've heard heavy metal and this and that. But then the songs are kind of parody like. But to me, it's smart. But I'm also a guy that loves Frank Zappa. Love Frank Zappa and Dweezil right. Zappa. So, yeah. so for me, Actually, a lot of shows on Diesel Zappa, and I'm um, ranked too. Yeah. So, one of the things is to me, I appreciate humor and it's tongue in cheek with a good song. So, yeah. to me, uh, you know, Ugly Kid Joe was a no brainer because, you know, it was a rocking version of, you know, something different, but it was fun yeah. and smart. Because I think, and I don't know, did you guys find it challenging with a record label as far as being like, sometimes you're serious, sometimes you're not? Like, you guys are some really good, serious songs. Like, um, yeah. like, uh, Cloudy Skies, that was one you wrote yeah. with a um, beautiful song, but it doesn't really fit. Like you have a lot of songs that are so different and eclectic. Uh, yeah, yeah, you know. G- the label must have pulled their hair I out. Think, sometimes I think, you know, I, I don't know if, I mean, even though Milkman, if you look at, I mean, I just check Spotify, just shits and giggling what we're doing on Kill the Pain and That Ain't Living. And uh, I didn't know if, you know, Milkman's son had that many plays against the rest of the record. Really? of motel i'm sorry of uh, minister sobriety so you know early on like you know i had guilt about you know because i'm from louisiana i have you know southern roots man and so also baptist roots which brings in a lot of these types of progressions that i write i thought you were gonna say guilt uh, and and rattlesnakes yeah you know? <laughs> but i had guilt i you know i had guilt <laughs> over over like whether because I had written stuff that I that just came to me, and I, you know, I was like, I don't know if this really is this a something bad for the band because they were previously just kind of a happy, like, but some pretty serious metal songs, you know, like Panhill and Prince. I mean, these are great things, and they, they work great live and everything else. Neighbor, badass songs to play. So when I brought in like my, you know, probably the reason I joined the band was because I used to go play Busy Bee all the time up in Santa Barbara when I was friends with Witten Klaus. I was friends with them, you know. Solid year and a half, man. And before I think I joined the band, you know, and but and so we would jam on songs, and then the record company decides to release that as a single, and it does terrible. So I felt like, damn, man, we should have probably went the other route. We came out of Cats in the Cradle to another fucking ballad. It's a band that everybody knew. I don't actually think they're going to play. It would have worked for you guys because, I mean, luckily yeah. you guys got the attention because I think if you said a metal band, it wouldn't have been. It's long lasting to begin with. The EP was very metal sounding, but a lot of my, me and my friends were so much more excited when this, the full album came out. Where it's a lot different, you know, and each each album was, was varied. Wow. I don't think I don't. I actually wouldn't have seen, in my opinion, the career to be us talking about a new album coming out as much because you it's got like almost like a cult status, whereas you aren't just yeah. Remember cool. that band that had those two cool albums in uh, ninety in early nineties. Weren't they a grunge yeah. band or something? Because you weren't, and you weren't like, but that was a time when you know, like, you know, you had Jane's Addiction and, and Chili Peppers, and you could have all these different sounds without still having a, a rock guitar, but having a different flavor, whether it's, you know, a funk or this or that. I mean, Bicycle. I mean, you have a lot of different songs, way different, you know? Even Busy Beast, it's a, it's got some serious lyrics, but they're also funny lyrics, but, but, it, but it's also beautiful. So, I mean, yeah. I don't know how you could have marketed that band. I just, I think you guys were, you hit it at a good time. I mean, what we talk about Frank Zappa. Cool. Wow, Frank Zappa had like what one or two hits, right? I mean, think how yeah. brilliant all those songs are. I'm not saying you guys are comparison, but I'm saying like it doesn't really matter because the usually your audience is not going to recognize that anyhow at the moment, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> it's just fucking happy hour, man. I'm um, I'm living the Florida life. <laughs> but uh, thank you for saying that. You know, you know, I, I can beat myself to death 
Why? Well, you know, because I'm the kind of guy that, you know, I read, I, I, I rethink things sometimes. I'm like, man, I, you know, did is did we do the right thing? So, I, oh, so that God. so that I can further adjust moving forward to the future. But often, I end up just freaking myself out over nothing. Use my and motto. Really, use my motto. You think, you stink. <laughs> yeah. Go with your heart. And you, got, you know what? And it really is up to the, the music listeners and not once you've done the art, you just got to let the music listeners enjoy it. And, and I often find that, wow, people love it a lot more than I thought they would, you know, and then they don't see the paranoia that I can get over. I actually as, like as the other songs or... better than the ones like the Milkman song. I've gone back and liked them more now because the less popular yeah. ones, the ones I enjoyed more. Yeah. Even because of was Airplay or whatever. To me, I like the other ones too, but to me, they're so, so different, you know. Yeah, you know, that record, man, Menace of Sobriety ha has become like our, you know, the Paul's Boutique of the Beastie Boys, which wasn't a large seller, but it was, it's the coolest fucking record on the planet, you it know, is. for them. I love that album. And so fans come up, man, they, fuck, they love Menace of Sobriety. And when I go back and listen to it, I'm like, that is a really, it's something so unique about that album. And like, uh, Bill Kennedy, the way it's mixed, like it's just a strange. Everything about it is so different than what was even in on the market at that time, and even yeah. now, it's just such a different. I love that now. I'm like, wow, we did something really original and, and unique. We we did, even though you know maybe the sales weren't up, but the sound of it is something that I think that people uh, will resonate with for a long time. Wow. Well, if you yeah, if you think about, it, I mean, look what happened to any of the bands. I mean. Uh, Faith the More would have been a, a, a serious band that also had mixed elements. You know what I mean? The numbers went down after a certain amount of time. It doesn't yeah. matter. And, and, and I mean, they've had their albums kind of considered be, continue to be great. Just because the sales are dead doesn't mean you're not good. It's just, uh, you know, you know. I guess just the uh, the machine and it was popular in the commercial. Whatever sense. was churning away at the time, yeah. And a lot of times it's yeah, just blind have... buyers. It's not the same. It's like I got this CD because it's cool. I I know that one song. No, but like I mean, every everybody. Are fans of like like all the are the albums, not the singles. You know? Yeah, dude. Yeah, I hope that continues on, man. Because you know, our tracks are really varied on the new album, and you know, I can't wait for the world to hear or the internet or I don't know about the world, but you know, we did a cover of Lola, and it's I think it's it, it's really. Oh, it's insane, man! I think it's the I think it's the best vocal that Wit's ever done. It's that good. It's really he's 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 interesting because he's a he's a great vocalist. He's always under the radar. He's like when there's something going on musically, you don't hear from him or see from him. Like he vanishes into like a back cave or yeah. something. And then what happens is and he, he comes out to plays, perform. He plays he a festival it. with with a bunch of other bands, and they go like, "Oh wait, what what the fuck just happened?" <laughs> yeah, and they're like, "Oh yeah, that's right." He's like, badass, man. Like. That motherfucker on a microphone, man, it's game over. You know, uh, but we, I was, I'm still grateful to have all those moments and, and have somebody like that to take it and, and over the top each night, you know, because we can play the music all day long. But if, if, if somebody can't come out there and sing like that, then you, it's less of a, a magical show, man. That guy can make, he could turn a regular show into something that is, it's so special. And every time you get off stage, you're like, wow, this is bad. Well, it's crazy. He's also, he's, he, well, his voice, celebration. That's he can run around and sing without losing his voice. He's just as strong now as he yeah, was. And some, he and he, he's, he's got a, you know, he's got a very uh, tried and true and weathered ability to communicate with large audiences, man. And I, I don't know if, I know I well, I know large I know huge bands. Obviously Corey is fifty right. times that when he goes out there with Slipknot. I mean it's, that's insane. It's ridiculous. Sully too. Sully takes the house down. But they're also a lot more famous. But like Wits right. in front of sixty thousand people and half of them probably don't remember Ugly Kid Joe or don't know in the first place. And he still got him out there fucking clapping and doing all this shit. Well, he's crazy. He climbs but he's also, too. But he's also like delivering monkey. he's also delivering, you know note accuracy in, in in strength man you know and that's something that's hard to do i mean I, you know it's really something to behold man it, to do that shit every night god it's a rough job but he, he's, he's one of the greatest of all time in my opinion it gathering whatever moment it is and then bringing that to the next level you know if it's already great he'll make it fantastic 
You know, if it's fantastic, he'll make us something that we all remember for the rest of our lives. You know, super, I definitely think super he's, he's, he's cemented dude. himself. And I think the last, you know, the Stairway album or EP and an album. Yeah. And then the new singles are coming out. Everyone's loving them because they're hearing his voice is still there. And they're, you know, a lot, a lot of the peers from back then have kind of thinned out now. And he's still there. They're like, oh, yeah, I remember these guys. Oh, these guys People are, are going to shit, dude, when they hear Lola. Yeah. It's it's true to the form of the, the original Kink song. But wait till you hear Wit sing this thing, man. It's it's gorgeous. It's ridiculously amazing. You guys got a lease already. I, I, you know, like I said earlier, Kill the Pain. That's another different song. That is so good. That's probably what I, I wrote. Say, yeah, I wrote that like fucking song. Songs in, by you guys. I wrote that in 2018 in a dark place. <laughs> I was partying a little too hard back well, then. Got, it worked out. It was a good track, song. Man. Train came yeah. off the tracks and I just started writing gnarly shit. Well, it, I don't want to say it's worth it, but it's worth it. It's a good song. It's a little different, but yeah, it fits, some, you know? Yeah, sometimes you have to go through it to write it. So, same with Long Road. You know, uh, no, I wrote a bunch of shit out of my head for this last record uh what's the other one back in everything changes is coming out i'm not coming out but it's on the record so how does that work out for songwriting because you're you're like what do you say you're are you out of louisiana i know everyone lives everywhere people i know live over in california well you know? i was in louisiana during this time that i wrote for yeah. this next record and boy it doesn't that? show we got some dark shit but it's beautiful stuff now you know That's so awesome. I yeah. know. And then me and dude, me and Witt got together here in Florida and came up uh with two other songs that are rad too. Man, it's insane, yeah. That's awesome. Now, are your you... Dead Friends Plays coming out yeah. on the album. Probably if I would assume we're gonna do videos and, and these will be singles as well. Because they're really great. And uh uh Up in the City is another one. Those are really cool songs. These are Wits creations you know that mm-hmm. i helped him out with the progressions and and he's also become a fabulous writer as well we discovered that you know he can he'll get them and put them on, on recorders and stuff but the translation part is what's so hard and i think that uh, me and him do that best uh, where i do it the best to get it out of his head and you know, onto a song that that ain't that ain't living the first single mm-hmm. is exactly what that is that's him going like down Da, 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 da. And me figured out what it is on the guitar, and then uh, he doesn't play. He doesn't play any guitar at this point. No, he figured but he, if he but started with, playing guitar earlier on. By now, he's been. <laughs> no, he doesn't play now. But he, you know, he it's in his head. You just got to get it out of there, you know. And that's at least for me, pretty pretty easy. You know, he's he's really, he's had trouble <laughs> with other people, man. They like the. It drives them nuts because they can't. It's like he's hearing this one thing, but they can't translate it out. You know, I, I'm good at it. So me and him have been really good at, at, over this Sorry, last partners. stretch of doing this. So, yeah, I can't so wait. It's to do coming that. out in October, I believe, right? Uh, I think so. I, I think it is. Yeah, I forgot. I think it is October. Though. I want to think like October 22nd. I, I was checking. I'm like, I thought it would be out sooner. I'm like, man, what's going on with the thing? I thought it was going to be out by... Well, right fuck, now. it was supposed to be out 2020. We were in, in like, El Paso, like, 2019. Uh, and we're all stoked. Like, well, it's going to come out. But COVID, you know, like everybody else. I'm sure there was a bunch of other bands just like us that were dying. Some held them and some released them. And some says I, by the time COVID yeah. was over, they have another album already written. And they just not going to hold songs. It depends on the band's yeah, yeah. You know, I don't think there's a right or wrong way. I just think it was whatever. As a fan, I enjoyed getting music during COVID because... You know. Oh yeah, but I yeah, for whatever that. reason, that's where we're we're at. So it's going to be uh, October touring. Uh, I, I know, I know. Are you gonna, are you going to tour with the band? No, they're already touring. Um, I'm out on touring. You know, I need to stay home and work. I start working again, which I love. I was going to like chill and retire, but uh, I got the spark again after Sully and doing the Godsmack thing, and now. I don't mind. I kind of do want to get back into mixing and whatever. You know, I just finished producing Shannon's uh, The Apocalypse Blues Revival, the vocals. I didn't produce mm-hmm. the album, but the vocals I just did for a week. And it's a great record, too. Holy shit. So I'm super proud of him as well, man. What a what a songwriter. 
Shannon's become too. What an album. God damn. It's really, really cool. So I, I enjoyed being back in the trenches and I, it's at home now. I got to, you know, literally have a studio with, a, I'm looking out at, you know, 250 feet in the air in a 24, 24th floor condo, which wow. is pretty badass. Yeah. So I'm digging it, man. Awesome. Yeah, you can't retire. Well, I want to, I want to thank you, man, for coming on. I mean, well, thank you. Really man. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, it's a great yeah, My pleasure. Awesome.